How much do you understand the correlation between international crisis and also what we called the food supply? Now, at this moment, one thing we have to understand: food has always been the priority, regardless if the country it's in the stability or it's in crisis. But right now, at this moment, for example, take a look at the country of China, the nation of 1.4 billion people today. Food. It's rather important and also significant. Everyone got to eat, but meanwhile, China today it's possible to face food supply shortage. And given the fact today, some players around China are not actually playing by the games. Now, when I say not playing by the games, which means not contributing to the global food supply, simply because this geopolitical change and also this unpredictability of the political uncertainty. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is Dr. Jiang Hongzhou. Dr. Jiang is a research fellow with the China Program at the San Radhanam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He received his PhD in public policy from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. He's the author and editor of numerous books. You might be familiar with his one of the amazing book, which is called "Securing the Rice Bowl: China and the Global Food a Global Food Security." Well, Dr. Zhang, and welcome to the missing piece. Thank you very much, Bill.、Uh, thank you very much for having me. Well, again, Dr. Zhang. Initially, when I discovered you, because this amazing article that you co-authored, which is called "China's Food Security After the Collapse of the Black Sea Grain Initiative," now just before、yes. taping the show, you and I we had a, a small discussion regarding what we called Belt and Road Initiative, which is rather well known to the world. But let's get to the fundamental question, Dr. Zhang. What is the Black Sea Grain Initiative, and why is that so crucial and equally important to the geopolitical change today? Well,、uh, um, thank you very much for the wonderful question. And let me just begin by saying、um, we had understand right, Ukraine and Russia are the top two, you know, one, two of the top, let's say, agriculture exporters, right? Um, in terms of wheat, in terms of corn, in terms of other agricultural products, and also in terms of fertilizers. So with the with the war started, let's say in February last year, then they、um, said export of agricultural commodities by those countries has been affected. So this、uh, so-called Black Sea Green、uh, Corridor Initiative is blocked by the United Nations, and then it involves four parties.、Right? Um, Russia and Ukraine and then Turkey and then the UAE on the other side. So allowing the partial export of agricultural products、uh, of Ukraine through、uh, Black Sea shipping routes.、Mm. No, but again, Dr. Zhang, I, I want to go back to the question. The, the content is regarding the food supplies. Again, as you mentioned before,、yes. has always been the priority for Beijing.、Mm. But as you、mm-hmm. mentioned, one of the critical players, which is Russia. Russia's withdrawal from the grain export scheme has been very limited. Now, again, help us with better understanding. Dive into a little bit better. I mean, a little bit better. What role does Russia play in this initiative, and what does that mean? Russia's withdrawal from the export scheme. How should we understand all of that? I think you asked a couple of questions. Let me just first by.、Uh, Let's start with this、uh, impact on China. I think that a lot of attention is about、um, how this will affect China's food security. There are a lot of focus on China for a simple reason because China, by、um, in general, is it has been by far the biggest agriculture importer、mm. globally. Not just from let's say Ukraine and Russia, but more importantly, as largest、uh, agriculture and food importer,、mm. it imports over 100 million tons of grain products, including soybeans, every year. Um, and also in terms of related to the so called、uh, Black Sea Grain Corridor Initiative, China has been by far the biggest recipient. I think forty to even sometimes right fifty percent. I can't remember exactly. Forty five percent. So that's why when Russia decided to withdraw from the Black Sea 
um, during Oregon initiative. There was lots of discussion about all these and potentially effects of food security in China. And I'm expecting like, you know, China is uh, in terms of the modern, or we could, in terms of proportion of grain received, uh, uh, we are, right, it's severely affected. And then we right, expect China to play a bigger role in terms of maintaining like, or bringing us off the back. Uh, to this negotiating table or bring back to the so-called initiative. Yeah. Um, but then I think that this uh, discussion on the entire narrative has least um, has overlooked some critical aspects of China's food security. Mm. Right. Uh, let me just start with a few. The first of all is that I, it is certainly true that the country is by far the biggest agriculture importer for them. Well, the fact we have to remember is that agriculture import, right, are mainly taking forms of soybeans, um, which is not really affected so much about the current, they say, uh, that you can work that's pretty much uh, um, wheat, coins, and others, not really uh, soybeans, which the United States and Brazil by, by the five most important suppliers. So, but then if you, let's say, remove soybeans from the raw equations of China's agriculture import, um, so the, the overall amount of um, coins and wheat, um, and other agriculture imports as yes, percentage of China's total production or total consumption is actually rather, rather, rather limited. Uh, again, it's still the number one importer in terms of number of critical agriculture products, but then the overall consumption is limited. And another thing is that it has a very, very big uh, reserve system. Um, says some, I mean, no one knows the exact figure uh, about how much grain reserve China has, right? From soybean to corns to wheat, uh, even right, recent years has been they included other critical agricultural products like um, meat and uh, edible oil. So, which means, right, uh, there has China has in terms of food resilience, it's in a much better shape as compared to many other countries. Mm. Um, and again, uh, it's the second largest economy, which means right, even if the price increased to right, say fifty or forty percent, right, it can afford. That is very different as it goes to many countries in Africa. That people have spent so much of their four reserves on buying agricultural products. Uh, so in terms of the stocks or impact on China, the overall food supply is. Um, is rather limited. And also, I think the, the another major fact is that the country has been always prepared for this perceptual disruption. That's why the diversification strategy is always a very important part of uh, the overall agriculture, you know, the overall sort of global agriculture policy and its full security strategy. Um, I think uh, even less than before the Russian form of a strong uh, from the Black Sea Union initiative, there's a number of other there's an important initiatives taken by China. They say they started allowing coin import from Brazil. Mm. It has been in terms of overall amount over the past few months has been increasing very rapidly. And also it has and other let's say uh, bilateral uh, agriculture cooperation yeah. agreements with Russia and other let's say uh, Asian countries, Central Asian countries. As well as with a lot of African countries, like the PRI and under other, let's say, frameworks. So, in terms of what it is, it has a much diversified source in terms of agriculture import. Uh, that's why the overall uh, Russians withdraw from the Black Sea, the impacts of the withdraw, Russians withdraw from Black Sea uh, Grand Corridor initiative have been rather limited on China's grand or overall for supply. I think the second question honestly is why Russia is so important in the Black Sea uh, initiated the question several questions, but uh, I guess this is uh, related to the, uh, the, the war situation and you know, still controls uh, able to control a lot of the sea the Russians, you know, Ukraine seaport basically um where those uh, ships they you don't know, leave the sea um, or leave and then sell through uh, basically depends on Russia's corporations. Mm. Listen, after really after after Russia's um, withdrawal from the Black Sea, Grand Corridor, 
or initiative that has been several times by Russia to either halt or stop some of the so called grand mm. trips. Mm. Dr. Zhang, I want to be fair. Again, right now, as I mentioned in the intro, the war in Ukraine continues. But in this article, from this food or global food supply, or we called global food security, both Russia and Ukraine contribute so much. Again, something that you mentioned, and I want to get your uh, better analysis on this. According to the article that you wrote, and I quote, Ukraine alone contributed 40% of the global trade in the sunflower meal, 35% of sunflower oil, and 5% of wheat and barley and corn exports. But meanwhile, we are looking at Russia also played a role in this food security as well. Now, China is in the middle so let again without getting too complicated from this geopolitical change dr Zhang, from your perspective how do you think that china today it's actually balancing those two major players on the stage when we are looking at this global food security and the second question is what does what role does china play when we look at this food security again let's answer question one by one but let's go with the first one Okay. I think you, you again raise very important and very good questions. Um, I think Russia is actually a much bigger agriculture um, player you know, globally you know, because it's, it has been a few years ago already became they said the biggest agriculture exporter, especially in terms of wheat. And also in, the importance of Russia in global food security is not just limited, let's say, uh, the wheat supplies and then the supply of other agricultural products. But also critical, they say, um, fertilizer, especially in terms of pottage, um, is a very, very big thing. Uh, and also in terms of potentials, you know, so Russia has so much um, exploited land. And then it's actually in terms of in the future uh, potential, right? People are talking a lot about the potential negative impact of climate change on uh, agricultural production. Actually, Russia is, as in according to different studies, is said to be the only problem on the most. I think the biggest benefit and factor of global warming because large right, um, air, of, air of land in uh, Russia's high east of eventually became you know, available for agriculture production when the weather became warmer. Uh, and then this, I think, does put Russia in a very important spot in terms of the global current and global food supply. Uh, and then, of course, the Ukraine, as you might right to mention, and also the numbers there, also still is, again, a major supply of export of several key agricultural commodities. I think, actually, Ukraine has long played a much bigger role for Chinese food security, uh, especially in terms of oil. Before 2000, if I remember correctly, before 2013 or 2002, right, um, I feel there was in the past, right, US, US was always has always was always China's list, the number one export of corn, which mm. about ninety or even higher percent. But then, mm. when there was concerns about over reliance on US for corn supplies, China adopted the diversification strategy. The country that China turned to is Ukraine. So within a very few years, right, Ukraine became replaced US as the big pop export of corn products to China. I remember it was even, let's say, about 10 years ago, there was some even uh, media discussions about uh, uh, Chinese state on Anglo is about spending, investing a huge amount of money, leasing or purchasing large area of land for corn production. Um, that will be shifted back to China. But, but of course, it is not to be true, but then it, uh, there was still right, a lot of investment by Chinese uh, Anglo including Kofko and others. In Ukraine, um, so the agriculture ties between Ukraine and China was a very important part of bilateral relations. Um, yeah, but then, um, this entire war was affected. I think for a few months after the war, we, we see a very dramatic decline of in Ukraine's agriculture export to China. But then, um, with this Grand Sea, uh, in the Black Sea Grand Corridor, of course, the uh, export continued result. Uh, resumed, and then China again began to be able to receive right, uh, so much 
Ukraine's channel um, from Ukraine under this corridor. That's why the people are saying kind of China has been by far the biggest uh, um, beneficiary or benefactor, um, who has been the one benefactor the most from this going. So the second question, yes, I think that is, yeah, explain the importance of uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, for China's food supply. That's right. So the so the second question related to China's role in this food security. I mean, again, we're looking at a country that mm-hmm. constitutes 1.4 billion people. As we mentioned before, mm-hmm. food has not has never been questioned as the priority. Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, yes. when China play an important role or say an indispensable role for the global food security. How much do you think that China can afford today mm. to move forward with the relationship mm. with Russia, with Ukraine? So in other words, what mm. role do we see China in this global sense when we talk about food supply? So, I mean, again, given the fact that China has to feed its own people first before helping others. Mm. I want to hear your thoughts. Mm. Yes, again, um as regardless of China's doing global food security, I think there's um, the basic fact is that China cannot feed itself by its alone. Right? Uh, that I think is, has been an established fact and well recognized by the Chinese leader, even against the current concept, let's say, backdrop of you know, the global food, the food supply became so volatile. Yes, I mean, a lot of countries have been reserving, you know, uh, reversing their policies and then or trying to boost domestic productions or self sufficiency. China has been doing that as well. It's not just like you predicted this current war uh, from the trade war with US and then with after COVID, right? You have so you can see there's so much so many domestic discussions and mm. also policy introduced by the Chinese government leadership statement, right? Emphasizing the importance of boosting domestic productions, the uh, self reliance, right? I think every single time, if you look at the statement, it always says about the importance of international supplies. Because they recognize that the domestic resource is very limited. Mm. I mean, there's no way China can become self-sufficient again, let's say, in terms of soybeans. And then the fact that why China is importing so much soybeans is that they made a strategic decision, right? Um, they had to concentrate limited agricultural resources in producing, let's say, strategic commodity or strategic commodity that is more important. Basically, in Chinese context, it rice, wheat, and corn. That's why the soybean has been sacrificed in a sense. Uh, so, so even that, right? It's still it's, it's impossible right now. It's about one hundred million tons of soybean, which is about seventy, sometimes sixty or seventy percent of global total trade in soybeans. So, in that sense, it will have to rely on the international market for food, like it or not. That is right in terms of resources constraint. The other is like right, the, the consumption, the public consumer in the food has been In essence, right, um, the international supply will be continue to remain important part or right, complement to the domestic production. Mm-hmm. And also because I right, right, mentioned the country has one point four billion population, which means right, even the slight change in terms of consumption behaviors or in terms of domestic production will have major impacts. Right? On domestic uh, global food supplies, which also means, right? Um, given is let's say from soybean to other agriculture but although the country in terms of almost import and as share of the total consumption is limited, but then in terms of China's import as share of let's say global trade and uh, commodities that we pay. Mm. So uh, in, in other words, right, the fluctuations or changes in the international food supply can have right, uh, impacts on the country's you know, uh, food supplies, like you know. Uh, and also, uh, there's a lot of you know, um, international pressures. Mm. Uh, the so called, there was so much concern about China effect uh, because the demand is there, and if let's say China start in, more, importing more, right, they always have this perception of fear that um, Chinese uh, import right, uh, will drive or many will, uh, will basically push the, uh, push up the international pricing eventually, which means that right, a lot of developing countries or poor African countries will not be able to buy food from the international market. Mm. Uh, so this kind of 
uh, I mean, we have the, it's kind of fear and also um, the fact that China continue to rely on the international market for food, uh, which means what it means is that right, you can't separate China from the international market. So uh, there are two, two kind of implications. The first is that slight changes of, in China's agriculture policy that have major impacts on um, the company, and also it means that um, um, let's say uh, changes in global food supplies, and then later we also have impacts on China's um, food security. Mm. Uh, so, let's say not, not even let's say not in the short term, but then in the medium to long term, it will um, affect the uh, one way or another on the food supplies. Mm. Dr. Zhang, I know your time is very precious. Now, I got two more questions before letting you go. Let's talk about your book. Again, it's called Securing the Rice Bowl, China and Global Food Security. Now, we are in the year of 2023. Again, despite the fact that people might not enjoy the conversation going back to the COVID period. But I think we learned so much when we were facing the lockdown and you know, globally, particularly for China as well. But meanwhile, we know because the pandemic, agricultural field or agricultural area was hit drastically because of the COVID. But now today, the entire world got opened up again. But I still want to bring China into our conversation. Dr. Jiang, again, going back to uh, the your book, how should we assess the agricultural development in China today. Some argue that because we see more modernization, we begin to see more rural areas start to get revolutionized because of the technology. But meanwhile, the the domestically speaking, agriculture is still the center of everyone's topic. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, how should we assess the agricultural development in China today, despite mm. we are seeing this economic stagnant or we call it economic slowness. What do you say to that? Mm. Well, uh, it's, it's a very tough question actually for me because uh, I had to be honest. Right? Uh, after the COVID lockdown, and then it has been four years. Um, I, I mean, this has the last time I went, to, went back to China to for research related to agriculture in 2019. Mm. So uh, I haven't actually <laughs> had a chance to see the latest development with my own eye. Right? Um, so I can't really make too much comment or too, because I did, they sometimes really have to see, be on the ground to see mm. the transformation or something. But let me let, let me Dr. John, let me let me let me ask the question in another way. Maybe you can help us with better understanding. Mm -hmm. Now again, post the COVID, how much do mm -hmm. you think that we, because of the food supply, this global relationship, China actually mm -hmm. grow much closer with the nation of Russia, with the nation of Ukraine? Because today we are mm -hmm. seeing this relationship only from this geopolitical mm -hmm. change. So mm. you're the expert. Do you think that post-COVID, mm. because the food supply demand increases, mm. China is actually mm. more active in looking for partners? Mm. What do you say to that? I, I think this is, this is a very fair uh, uh, statement. And actually, it, 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 it has been a continual, uh, has been a continuous development. Right? Even without COVID, I think uh, you will expect to see, at least if you read my book, I, Mm. One of the key arguments, right? The title of the chapter is that China is not too waste uh, for for grant. Mm. Which basically, um, I made a prediction of my argument in 2017 when I wrote the book that because of the deterioration concerns about China's China's concerns about over reliance on West, on uh, US, and then European countries for several key agricultural uh, commodities, wheat, coins, and others, right? Is seeking to diversify countries that is has been with the target countries that China has won with a big bear look on this So you have Russian, Central Asian, Central Asian countries, Ukraine become key and uh, uh, you know, key stores of new supplies for coins, for wheat, and uh, edible oil. I think that trend continues and then being accelerated by COVID. And also, it's not just COVID, it's the trade war with US because the entire trade war. Right, we see the ultimate, 
we see there's growing confrontations between not just between U.S. and China. It's also is between by uh, Singapore, the agricultural trade becomes source of tension between Canada, between Australia and China, involving let's say from edible oil to barley and other grains, which so. We see China has been preparing for this, right? So Russia is very, very important part of the China diversification, diversification effort. Actually, if you recall what happened before, right before Russians, you know, it's the invasion of Ukraine, right? uh, when the, during the so-called Winter Olympic, right, mm. voting with China, the major deal signed is the, is the full deal on, um, the I think it's about China allowing uh, full scale import of wheat uh, from Russia. Mm. So it's a, it's, it's a very big development. Right then, right now, uh, just a few days ago, right then, one part of, that's part of the so called Beyond Roads agreement signed between two countries. Right? Another major uh, deal is again related to agriculture. Right? It's a big, big number, I think, it's even more than that. Uh, so allowing more um, Russians agricultural products to to be exported, right, using its channels to China. Mm. Uh, the same thing applies to many other, let's say, from African countries to Central Asian countries and also Southeast Asia. Because Southeast Asia is a very important part of China's diversification, diversification, diversification effort as well, uh, in terms of tropical growth, in terms of wheat. Uh, so this trend, I think, will continue. And uh, yeah, let's say back in terms of Ukraine, I think this is a bit unfortunate because if let's say without the war, right, Ukraine will be remain a very important part, mm. especially in terms of corn supply to China. Mm. Uh, yeah. There has been a lot of investment already by China on in Ukraine in the entire food supply chain sectors. And mm. but then right now, no one knows how long the war will last. That's right. Um, and, yes, and that's why I think China has been looking for, as I mentioned earlier. New suppliers, right? Brazil, with Brazil in mind, that's, if you look at the data in the past few weeks, or um, in, in the past few months, right? The new has been increasing very rapidly. Mm. Um, so it's always, we are always trying to diversify. Um, and we are trying to the preferred partners, we are, of course, with the countries that um, China has, really right, enjoys relatively, relatively favorable relationships. Um, basically, like right, Europe countries, basically Latin American, Latin American countries, um, Southeast Asian countries. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Dr. Zhang Hongzhou. Again, Dr. Zhang, it's a research fellow with the China program at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And I strongly encourage everyone go online to connect with Dr. Zhang through social media and check out his book, which is entitled Securing the Rice Bowl, China and the Global Food Security. And as well, as in addition, his amazing article, we say, China's food security after the collapse of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Well, Dr. Zhang, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and we'd love to have you back on the show as we continue to follow and pay attention to the global food security as well as other international players. So thank you so much for doing this.